Hey guys, this will be video 9 for the how to design build a custom flying V. Uh, sometimes using Stuart McDonald templates, but for the most part, uh, this being a custom guitar, uh, I would refer back to my earlier videos in this series. Uh, I pretty much showed you how to build this thing from scratch. However, uh, I think if you've got some templates for a guitar, the other build, then, you know, obviously you could use them or at least use them to uh, verify some of your uh, custom decisions. So I got a ton, I got a ton of, of information to cover, but I'm just going to kick back and go real slow and not get in a hurry and just try to uh, make this video as uh, informative as possible, yet keeping in mind uh, I'm emotionally detached from this guitar. It's actually uh, going to hopefully sell this Sunday. Uh, if not, we'll relist it and uh, we'll up the price a little bit and do a little bit more work to it. <laughs> so, in other words, uh, uh, make it more uh, more uh, valuable to certain people because a lot of people don't like a project. Uh, they like a finished guitar. All right, so what do, what do we want to start with? Um, I'm about to join the, the neck to the body on a two-degree pitch. And uh, a few nights ago, uh, I realized uh, I didn't have enough mother of pearl so I ordered my uh, mother of pearl dots the the you know the uh, uh, fret marker dots uh, from Stumac. so they're supposed to be here uh, by Saturday so that'll be awesome that's gonna be white mother of pearl on a rosewood fretboard so it'll be pretty pretty authentic looking uh, and a lot of this video, I'm just going to read from my list here because that'll really keep me on point and uh, keep us rocking along. So let's talk about tuner options very briefly. And, um, and primarily because the Flying V is a headstock diving you-know-what. It's, it, it's, it's the equivalent of the SG. And when I was a kid, I'm 54 years old. No, actually, I'm 55 now. I forgot I just turned 55 in January. So um, so as a kid, my first guitar was a, it was probably a 64 uh, SG. And I loved everything about that guitar. But man, it was a nightmare to uh, keep that thing from headstock diving. So uh, for the record, let me check if this is in the camera. I'm going to knock this over the fence very quickly. This is an old custom key tone. I'm going to give you some uh, uh, weight in grams of your tuners. And then we're, we're going to talk about design reasoning later on. These are an old vintage set of customs from the 70s that were typically a replacement for the, uh, the Gibson. Okay. Uh, 39 grams. Your Spurzel. Oh, that doesn't have the Spurzel with uh, the hardware. 28 grams. Uh, uh, these are uh, Gatos uh, vintage. Don't have the screws, the mounting screws, but close enough for Rockabilly. 23 grams. Nice and light. This is a set of authentic made in Germany uh, shalers. These are the M6. I have a set of these for a custom strat. I'm planning on building the six in line. So the three by three would have a larger tuner. So in other words, these are the M6, the real small button 32 grams fairly heavy uh, it's German it's you know there's a lot of engineering there probably really high quality metal does that affect the tone uh, go do your research uh, it I don't know truth be known I don't really think it does I don't think it matters so especially with the digital <laughs> world now so uh, all right let me uh, get this cleared and off but we're gonna use this again in a little while because the grand finale in this video series is we're going to do some tap tone analysis between a, a vintage 50s Les Paul and a tap tone analysis between this guitar that is a custom build. That'll give you an idea of the, the, the world that we're in. And uh, we'll talk about uh, weight and balance as well. Okay. So uh, 
so there's there's your and oh, okay now let's let's move to design and I'll, I'll talk about some of this work later on if I talk about it all let me just do a quick flyby in case I forget to talk about it that way you can just see the progress that was achieved added the little the little fillet down there glued that in with uh, uh, I usually use epoxy but uh, it was such a beautiful precise fit that I used tight bond was able to clamp it really well and uh, from a tonal standpoint it's just as good as, as it was so and the funny thing is the bulk of it might even get cut out anyway or some of it might get cut out okay so that's that's enough about the flyby Where, here's your objective when you're building this guitar if I if I cover anything is is this right here I don't If you go online and you research an authentic 50s Flying V, that's what you're going to see. This housing is so, so very close to that corner. But so in other words, you can just about design your headstock from certain variables once you achieve that. In other words, if you got this tuner an eighth of an inch lower or an eighth of an inch higher, and you flip it around, it's not going to look vintage correct. So those are the things that the purists out there are really looking for. If it matters at all, it, and does it matter? No, not really, especially from a functional standpoint. But what does matter is the distance from tuner to tuner location to tuner location. Uh, this being a, uh, a custom, you know, custom guitar that I've built. Pulled it out of that tape. I had that tape up there so I wouldn't do that. Bear with me for a second. If I don't protect these strings, it'll get it'll get bent and it'll get a kink in it. And I paid too much for these strings to well that's just great. All right, that's what you're looking for. Just take a picture, take a mental picture. The distance between the housing to the housing is roughly going to be based on the center from here to here. And that magic number is just a little bit over one and three eighths of an inch or a little bit under one and three eighths. Uh, I put them in at one and three eighths inch. In other words, it's a two and three quarter from the center of that one to the center of that one. That's how I build all of my Gibson type guitars or Gibson inspired guitars. And what that does, that creates a certain fan on the, the strings. Once the strings come off the, the nut and go to each tuner, it looks like an authentic guitar. If you start messing with this too much, you'll lose the visual appeal and, and it, it will just look really, really odd. And also, primarily, you'll lose the function. Now, what's going to blow your mind, the actual authentic uh, 50s and even the replica, the modern uh, reproduction guitars, they're four inches wide right here. It's ridiculous. The, the guitar is always way too wide. And, uh, and then it's a different, it's a far sharper point. But my, this is my own design that I've come up with in order to um, uh, get the best of both worlds. And it was based on the fact that the distance from here to here and the distance from here to here and then these other distances just kind of fell in place so that once this thing screws together, bolts together, it looks like a, a vintage guitar, but it's considerably different. Uh, this is scaled down. My headstock is scaled down about 7%, maybe 10% max, but it still looks like an authentic guitar and it functions uh, perfectly. But what did I achieve? The long way around to the end of this conversation, I got to stop because <laughs> I'm going off the rails. I, I alleviated every bit of the headstock dive out of my design. Okay. So, and that, if that's, if anything, I could end the video right there because that makes, let me check the time, that makes this guitar that I've designed 
uh, so much more player friendly because the reason I brought up talking about the SG and then uh, I've owned uh, some Flying Vs, I think. No, I, I've never owned a, an authentic Gibson Flying V nor an Epiphone. I've played a lot of them, but the first, the, you know why I didn't, didn't buy one? Because I couldn't stand the way they felt. They were so headstock heavy. So anyway, neither here nor there. By going with these tuner weights uh, at, a, at a certain distance, you'll see that you, you maintain your visual appearance. And then once you get up here, this housing is such that uh, it visually, you, you want to make certain that you don't start encroaching on the, on the opposite tuner, whatever string that would be. I don't want to try to do the math because I'm already about five minutes behind on this video. I'm not going to pause this video because if I pause this video, it's going to screw up my camera. So uh, this di design will also permit you to go with a Spurzel, which the Spurzel housing uh, gives you plenty of footprint left over. But if anyone decided to uh, go historical, then uh, I've already covered that. So, okay, there you have it. All right, let me get the tuners off the off the table and just go back to reading my notes because that will probably get me on point really fast. And um, your nut options, don't even want to talk about it because by now you should already know uh, what nut you're going to go with, whether you're going with a traditional nut. doesn't matter whether it's bone, brass, or... Uh, what's the tusk, um, but if you're going with the uh, Floyd Rose then or a locking nut, then you would have needed to have engineered that into your project. And you can see where I screwed up. I let my little my little tester <laughs> bit <laughs> went too deep, so I got to fix that. So, all right. So uh, we can check off nut options. Um, heel options. This is pretty important. Uh, when you're building a custom guitar, You've got to make a decision, as I mentioned in one of the videos, what is it that I'm building and what is it that I truly want to look like and feel like and play like and all that jazz. Well, the heel is, is fairly critical on this guitar, as I've already mentioned a few times. But what I would recommend, just go online and, you know, go to like Reverb or eBay or any, any of the online pictures and uh, you're, you're going to find what appeals to you. And then just uh, just replicate that as best you can. This design that I'm holding in my hand right here, this is uh, a 1975 to 1984 uh, temp, uh, a Gibson um, Custom Les Paul that I restored about nine months ago. And that's the exact tracing. It's a little bit more modern, but I incorporated it into the last Flying V that I built, the Red Sparkle one, and uh, it looked incredible. It gave it just enough modern appeal that it felt great as a player, but it also looked a little bit historical because the historical Flying V, um, this is this this point is a little further back, but it's much more straight. And then all of a sudden you go over here and it really just radiuses over with a very very tight small radius. Now if you visit Five What World on uh, YouTube, pull up the Explorer. And look at the video where he does a, a, a video about the a video, the Explorer from the 50s. Positively stunning heel. If you, if you really want to build a beautiful guitar, I'd recommend replicating that heel in, in, in the 59 Explorer. Because they brought the Carina all the way down just like this. Flush with the back. And then they shaped it a little bit more uh, elegant and a little bit more elliptical. Okay, so stop talking about that because I don't want to waste time. But just uh, go online, take advantage of your pictures, and uh, build your own guitar. All right. Um, also, when you're looking at these guitars online, like especially if you're look, watching a guitar on Reverb or eBay, um, if it sells for $7,000, that ought to tell you something. If it's online and it doesn't sell, well, then that ought to tell you something. And sometimes I get myself in trouble. I'm bad about doing these uh, kind of unique custom guitars. Uh, it usually scares people. They don't bring very much money, but they're fun to build. I don't. It doesn't cost me very much to build them, so I can afford to kind of let some of the guitars go <laughs> a lot cheaper. Is what I'm saying. But if you're looking at, it, if you're a really good woodworker and you're thinking about doing this, 
and you want it to have some value, I'd probably recommend going with a really pretty blonde Lemba, a white Lemba that's very clear and build the uh, neck and the body out of Lemba and then uh, rosewood fretboard, historical scale, you know, do the real McCoy. You might want to build your headstock a little bit bigger if you want, so it's a little more traditional. That way, if you ever have to pawn and or unload that guitar, <laughs> then it's worth some money, okay? But if you're just building because you're you're having fun and you're enjoying it, then the sky's the limit. Do whatever you want to do. All right. Um, if you don't know, and this is kind of a general video, and then I'm going to stop making that statement and just get back. Um, but if you don't know exactly what it is you want to do, then I've mentioned in some of the past videos, go visit, but you know you're going to do it. Okay, that's the caveat there. You know you're going to do it. You got the bug. You're driving yourself crazy, and, and you already pulled the trigger, and maybe you spent 500 bucks on your wood or 300 bucks on your wood or 200 bucks on your wood, whatever you spent on it, you, you invested in it and you got some prize Honduran, you know, or the limbo, like I just said at this point. Uh, but you don't know what it, the design, how to really do the design. Maybe visit a, a historical, I mean, like a vintage music store and, and or a shop where, you know, there's a really high quality guitar hanging up on the wall for sale. Uh, I w I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I have this image of visiting, uh, a, a, a vintage music store. I, I'm thinking of a guy in Birmingham, Alabama, super nice guy. I've known him forever, but, uh, if I was going to build a guitar, uh, he's the type of guy that might allow me to, um, uh, play one of his, uh, you know, 56 strats or, uh, a sixties V and he might even let me measure it. Okay, I'm not going to say anything else because I've never done that. But you might visit a pro shop like that and say, hey, look, you know, I, I'm going to do this, but I don't want to F it up. But I got to buy, you know, I got to buy a bridge. I got to buy two pickups. I need a case. I'll make a deal with you. I'll 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 buy these items from you. Uh, I'm not asking for a good deal. I'll pay you retail. You know, I want to see you make a little bit of money off this deal as well. Um, if you just let me let me play your your vintage, whatever it is you're building, and you might find that you hate the thing, and you might be thankful that you you've still got that limba that maybe you can relist it and get rid of it, or either you might realize, oh yeah, this is the cat's meow. I got to build this guitar. And at least that way, you won't end up with this guitar being an inch and a half too short, three quarters of an inch too narrow. This crotch is way that, you know what, up here, or it's way the heck down here. Uh, it'll really make certain that you come out of the gate with a beautiful and tasteful guitar. So, And why do I think part of that is kind of okay? Because Robert Benedetto, when I was studying his series, he made this statement about that's where he learned how to do every bit of his building is from restoring the old guitars, the vintage guitars. And did he measure those guitars? I'm not going to say that he measured them and traced them, but he knew exactly what they were and he knew what was really, really nice and valuable. So anyway, and I'm going to stop talking about that because I'm getting way too off in the, to the general, general realm. Uh, let's do a little bit of wait. Let me check the time. Uh, 18 minutes. I always end up at this 18 minute thing. When I'm when I'm feeling like I'm wasting time, let's do some very quick uh, weight analysis and uh, let's do some balance first. And this is something that I didn't plan for, so let me just do it. Got a little triangle. I want to do a comparative between a Les Paul, and you definitely do not want to do this in marker. Uh, Let me just do it. Okay, so you see what I'm doing. I'm gonna pause the camera. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make these marks. Then we're gonna come back and talk about the difference. Okay, let's uh, close it out. Um, I've got that about as close to the balance point as you can get, okay? May not be able to 
get this one. I, I do have a mark on this and we'll, we'll see. In other words, I'm doing a, a, compa a raw comparative. Okay, man, I almost got it perfect right there. Okay, now let's measure that. Wow, I can't believe it didn't even take measure. We'll go, we'll go cowboy here. Seven and a half inches from the top of the nut. Seven and one quarter from the top of the nut. Seven and a half for the Les Paul, seven and a quarter for the Flying V. It's pretty similar. You know, it, it's, it's a very similar guitar. I mean, neck. Even the thicknesses, you name it. Okay, let's do a quick wait. And I, I really, I didn't prepare for this video. I just literally had this idea at the last minute when I was getting ready to press, press play. All right, this is how much the raw flying V neck weighs. We're in grams. No magic. Four seventy eight. Four hundred seventy eight grams. Four hundred fifty nine grams for the Les Paul. Okay, so uh, we'll do some engineering with those numbers later on. But uh, it's interesting; they're very close. I was surprised. I was expecting it to be considerably different on the Flying V, but that, that's pretty interesting. So, for you physics guys out there, you might take those numbers, and I don't know what that fret location is, but just remember the numbers that I gave you. And uh, you might could calculate uh, centers of gravity and balance. Why? Because when we're when we're building the uh, the flying when we're building the flying V, because the strap location is right here, uh, way beyond the end of the fretboard for the most part, or right at the end of the fretboard. Versus the Les Paul is up here at I believe the sixteenth fret. Yeah, it's it's at the sixteenth fret. So that's why the Les Paul and is is not doing any nose diving and if someone had just put their a strap button on the sg at the end of the horn well then that would have allevi alleviated all of your uh headstock dive so uh let me check my notes don't really want to go into any uh tap tone analysis unless there's just um, plenty of time left yeah let's do that i'll stop talking And I'll just do the tap tone. All right, so if you got your buds in, take them out, or if you your volume is up, turn it down. I'm just going to do a short analysis. Let me let me get a let me get a, a comfortable point on this guitar where it feels balanced. It's absolutely piercing right there in the middle. That's amazing. And if we have time, I'll do a weight analysis on that. I think they're fairly close in weight. Again, I'm not saying one's better than the other or one's worse. Uh, I don't think I'll have time to do weight analysis, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. If the camera cuts me off, then uh, just read the number. Okay. I'm not sure if the camera's still recording my audio. 2,344 grams. 
5.168 pounds. Ah, I got the strap buttons in there. Five point five three six eight pounds, two thousand five hundred eleven grams. So you can see that a Les Paul is heavier, but not considerably. Uh, that's a that's a heavily uh, chambered guitar, engineered chambering. Twenty five minutes. Uh, it may still be recording my audio. I doubt it. Uh, but I'm not going to be negative. Uh, there's a possibility it could be recording the audio. So if it is, that's cool. If not, I'll just do some imagery here of what this thing's going to look like. It's going to be just positively stunning. That's called a stinger, just like the stinger on a bee. Ah. Should have taped it down. Really beautiful. It's really cool. And then imagine the black top. I'm not completely certain. I'm not going to just veneer this and uh, stain that clear because that's the way the traditional ones are. The traditional ones are not black around this side. You have the clear mahogany and that mahogany stays clear all the way around and you only have the stinger on the back and then the black face plate. That's the traditional guitar. So there's a possibility I'll do that. So I reserve the right to change my mind. Uh